Amen. Father, we thank you because you are with us always. Thank you, Father, because you are here. And you are healing every heart. Thank you, Father, for being in our midst today. Let us be reminded that we also are in your presence. Father, we thank you because you are in our midst and we are in the midst of your goodness. May we never forget who we are and where we are. In the mighty name of Jesus. Be seated. God bless you. All righty. Um... Tonight, by the grace of God, we will examine a couple of scriptures, and we will also, I want to encourage you, be spoken to by the Lord individually, because there are times wherein the Lord God sends you a man or a woman who has baked goods for you. Someone who presents to you that which they have already received of the Lord, and that is bread. But the Bible says that man shall not live by bread alone, but by every word that proceeds from the mouth of God. And so that means God wants you to hear what he is saying even when the prophet is not around. He wants you to hear what he's saying when the pastors are not around. He wants you to hear what he is saying when the evangelists are not around. In those moments wherein you are by yourself with the Lord, he wants you to hear what he is saying. And that is what it means to be able to obtain and to do every word that proceeds from the mouth of God. So tonight, we will dine together. We will have bread fresh from the oven of inspiration, served with the diligence of unction. But I tell you what, also you must be ready to receive that word that is being spoken by God through the ministry of his Holy Spirit in what might be a gentle whisper to your own heart. It is critical and expedient for you to be able to catch that word today. Simply because we have been called individually to special assignments. And those assignments have to be done to the instructions that come from the Almighty God to you as the individual. Sometime this week, I reminded my wife Oh, my wife and I were talking about the prophet, that prophet uh, that was sent by God to deliver a word to the king, and he delivered the word. A very powerful word was delivered. It was a younger prophet, and the older prophet came and said to him, oh, this is what the word of the Lord is. The word of the Lord says to me, don't go where you came from. Don't go by the same route that you came. Go another route. And this younger prophet was like, but God specifically told me to go this route. And woman, I want to help you. I don't usually do this, but you're not supposed to leave now. Don't let another voice take you away from where the shepherd is speaking. You came in here today simply because you have been troubled on every side. There are agents of darkness assigned with spears that are brutally sharpened, poking at you, making you bleed out the life of God that is in you. And yet in the middle of a delivery of a word that can take you away from the midst of the vultures, another voice tells you to get up. Everything must be brought to subjection. I don't usually do this, but I do this today because my heart goes out to you. Now the choice is yours. You can stay or you may leave. You see, times come wherein we have to do things differently. But we have to recognize that when a message comes saying that there is bread being served, but yet everyone must hear that which the Lord is speaking. 
God forbid that we miss our visitation. And so my wife and I were talking about that prophet and that prophet says to the older prophet, but God said to me specifically to come back, to go back the same way that I came. And the older prophet says, I am an older prophet, I am experienced, and I heard God. Do not go back the way you came. A little base, Emmanuel, if you can. And the man of God, thank you, that works, said, well, since you are the older prophet, I'm going to do what you said. And the Bible says the moment he stepped foot onto the path that was instructed by the older prophet, guess what happened? A lion came and devoured him. And the lion did not even eat him. The lion just killed him and sat next to him, making sure that he, the lion, became a sign to others. That when the Lord gives you an assignment, you do it and you stand by it. This man did not stand in the calling that God has upon his life. Now, let me tell you something. The older prophet heard God. The older prophet was sent as a test to the younger prophet. Because each and every one of us have to have a relationship with God and we need to know the voice of the good shepherd. Jesus says, I am the good shepherd and my sheep know my voice and they will not be swayed by the voice of another. The most important thing that we can do here in the body of Christ and in assemblies like this is to be able to help you recognize and pay attention to what the Spirit of the Lord is saying to you. You know, many people have found it as a lucrative business, which it is if you want to make money, to continue to groom other people to depend on what they say rather than encouraging people to find for themselves the frequency that the Holy Spirit is speaking on. I can invite you to my house every day to come and listen to the radio. But at some point, you have to go back to your house. Why do I invite you to come and listen to the radio at my house just when I can also show you how to tune your radio? It is great for us to listen together. Sometimes it is fun, but there are also times wherein you must be on alert and be able to hear from the device that God has given to you. Because one of the things that the Lord is calling my attention to increasingly of late is the fact that there is something called the will of God. And there are things that are being done on earth that are not the will of God. They look glamorous. Some of them actually look spiritual, which is the term we use for things that are extremely religious, by the way. We try to do things in the name of God, but doing things in the name of God is not the same thing as doing the will of God. There is a difference. I can do things in the name of God all day long, in fact, Jesus says, many will come in my name. He says, but you have to inspect their fruits, for by their fruits you shall know them. We can do things in the name of God all day long, but that doesn't mean that we are doing the will of God. And you see, the reason why the Spirit of the Lord moves in the body of Christ through gifts and offices such as the prophetic, or the office of a prophet, is because every now and again, the ecclesia needs to be pointed in the right direction. Because the ecclesia comprises in the natural of men who have feelings, who have emotions, who hear other voices. And so there is a need for prophets that will point you in the direction that you must be going as opposed to the direction that you may have chosen to go in. And that is the reason why many times prophets who are genuine prophets are not popular because people in this generation have not much interest in sound doctrine. The Bible says in the last days, men will heap for themselves teachers who say what they want to hear. Because in those last days, men will no longer be able to endure sound doctrine. And when I've looked through scripture, I have yet to find a popular prophet. A prophet that everybody agrees with. A prophet that everybody wants to follow. 
If you look at people like Isaiah, all through his ministry, there were times when we don't even have a record of him having an assistant. There were prophets like Jeremiah, no record of him having an assistant. Maybe on occasion he had some help. But they were mostly just people who had to operate by themselves because half the time they were saying things that could get them into trouble and people would always be happy to just let them get into trouble by themselves. Jeremiah went to prison because he was saying what God was saying that was completely different to what everybody else was saying. But because of the word of the Lord that came to us, Recently, that we need to prophesy because the men of Anathoth have come out to threaten us, saying that we need to keep quiet. And the Lord is saying, don't let them shut you down. You need to prophesy. And so because there is a command and an injunction by heaven for many to rise and speak the mind of God, which is what prophecy is, to speak that which is on the heart of God, I know that because of that reason, the onus has come to be on me in this season to tell you more about how to operate as a prophet. How to speak as an oracle of God. You see, because speaking as an oracle of God is hardly ever celebrated in the time of your delivery. A lot of the prophets we celebrate today, we celebrate them in retrospect. We celebrate them after the fact. When they were out here prophesying, people didn't want to hear what they were saying because it is, it is required for you as a prophet to not speak of your own. To not add to the word that you have received. To deliver it as it is being given to you. And quite often, it is hard for people to swallow. And so people would find a mix of things, someone who has seasoned the word with a little bit of encouragement, seasoned the world with uh, a little bit of political uh, motivation and agenda. But the word of God should always be the word of God. And so one of the things that you need to look out for in this calling and election is you need to look out for The unusual. You need to look out for the unpopular. You need to look out for the uncommon. Let's take a quick look at the book of Matthew chapter 7. And I will show you. Before we do that, there is an express instruction concerning Jeremiah chapter 9 verse 11. There is an express instruction Concerning Jeremiah 9-11, we will go there and, and see what the Lord has for us before we proceed to anything else. So the word of the Lord says in Jeremiah chapter 9, verse 11, it says, I will make Jerusalem a heap of ruins, a den of jackals. I will make the cities of Judah desolate without inhabitants. Let nobody bully you into praying because of what is in the news. Like I told you, I signed up for being unpopular. And I'm okay with it. You see, I'm okay with it because of the things that I have seen. You see, tonight we sang a song that I once didn't like. And the Holy Spirit knew that I didn't like it, even though I didn't tell anybody anything. I was going to say something, but I never did. And then one day, the Holy Spirit said to me, he says, but seriously, why don't you like that song? I said, because the reality of it is, that why are we singing about the bride of Christ? What has that got to do with anything? And the Holy Spirit said to me, where did the idea come from of the new city that will be called the bride of the Lamb of God? I said, well, we, we, we read it in scripture. And the Holy Spirit said to me, okay, if it is in scripture, then that means it came from me because all scripture, the Bible says, was given by the inspiration of the Holy Spirit. He said, so if you don't know the reason why, just ask rather than giving us an attitude. I said, okay, I'm asking now, why is that even important? 
He said, well, the reality of it is that the way you are designed, when the time of the end comes, your father will give you speed. And when he grants to you speed, you could run into a wall if you don't see ahead far enough. The faster you move, the further ahead you need to see. So that if you need to navigate, you can navigate without crashing into obstacles. So if I am moving only at one mile per hour, I don't have to see beyond one or two steps because I'm not going that far. And so if there's an object in front of me like this object, I can easily just navigate around it because I'm not moving far. I mean fast. But if I was traveling at a thousand miles an hour, I need to be able to see at least 10 miles ahead of me because before you say Jack Robinson, I've already gotten to the 10 mile line. You understand what I mean? Because the faster you move, the more distance you cover within a short period of time. Right? And so within a couple of seconds, I could have gone over several miles. And so if I don't see those miles ahead of time, then I'm going to crash into it. And so the Lord said to me, because the Lord, your Father, the Lord of all spirits has committed to shortening the days or the times in those days, it means it will grant you speed, and with speed comes the need to be able to see far ahead. He said that was the reason why I included in Scripture a marker for you to set your eyes on. He says, I want you to know that a time is coming wherein a city will come out of heaven, whose maker and builder is your heavenly Father. And he says, when you have that revelation of what it means to step into a city whose maker and builder is God, he says, then you will know that faithful is he who has promised. Because when Jesus was raised from the dead and he showed up in the presence of his heavenly father, God was very pleased with him. And God says, you have completed your assignment. Now sit at my right hand until I make all your enemies your footstool. Do you know one of the attributes of the new city that is called the bride of the Lamb of God is that no evil thing or a thing of defilement can get into that city. So when God promised Jesus to make all his enemies his footstool, he decided also to make his abode of eternity a city that no evil can come into. So that when Jesus gets into that city, he can be at rest completely, knowing fully well that there is no more battles. And that is the reason why the Bible says, forever, O Lord, your word is settled. Jesus is the word of God. And when we were singing that song tonight, one of the songs, one of the lines of the song says this is the city of the Lamb of God, the very word of God. God has decided that he will settle Jesus into that city. He says, this is yours. You're settled forever. There you will be, you and your friends. We are not the bride. We are the friends of the bridegroom. That's what he calls us. Some theologians who came along the line started calling us the bride. But when you look into scripture, you will not find in a single place wherein it says that we are the bride of Christ. You know, the Bible says husbands love your wives as Christ loves the ecclesia that he gave himself. It was a simile. He says, because he gave himself, that is the way you as a man should give yourself for your bride. But every other mention to us, we were called the friends of the bridegroom. We are the pillars that will be in the temple with him when he receives his bride. The Bible makes it clear that that bride that comes out of heaven is that city that comes out of heaven is the bride of the Lamb of God. And so the Holy Spirit said to me, it is important for you to have that revelation of that city, to have that mark that is so far ahead it is beyond the millennial reign it is beyond the thousand years of deception it is beyond the judgment of the wicked it is even beyond the time that the righteous receive their reward it is far ahead into the future he said but I need you to know that it is there so when you are granted speed you have a marker with which to navigate the waters I didn't know that we we're going to sing that song tonight but as I was coming here today while I was driving, that was the vision that I went into. I went into a vision wherein I saw this huge craft that looks like something out of a sci-fi that was traveling at such a speed. And it was traveling through water, but underground. And it was moving so fast and suddenly there appeared a huge mountain. And I was like, so what do we do now? Because at this speed, we are crashing into that mountain. 
And I was told that the one who is navigating that ship already knows that there is a passage through the rock. And I came out of that vision. I continued driving on I-85. I'm a multidimensional human being, so don't report me to the authorities for distracted driving. I was still driving. And I have proof I got here. You see, because I know where your mind is going to, then how do you do that? Well, the one who packaged me the way that he did, he did it in such a way that I can manage to do things like that. When I was little, they used to be concerned for me because I would zone out in the middle of a task. And they were calling me, but I was gone. But then when I get back, I pick up whatever I left, I've left off or whatever is left to do, we do it. You see, but I have gone through a lifetime of living like that. So now I am comfortable going in and out of trances and still being able to function. I mean, my wife struggled a lot at the beginning of our marriage because she will be talking to me and I'll be somewhere else. I'll be standing there, but I am gone. And she would get angry. And sometimes I would suddenly wake up and I'm like, there was a lady here and she was talking to me. And so I would go and look for her and say, why did you leave? We were talking. You left in the middle of a sentence. And she would say to me, no, I waited and waited for you to say something and you didn't. So I left you there. And so I used to plead with her a lot. I'm like, no, don't do that. Next time, just stay. And one day she stayed and stayed and stayed. And I was there. I seemed like I was looking at her, but I wasn't. And so she was like, okay, now I'm going to let you know that I've been here for like five minutes. Do you want me to still wait? And so the reality of it is this. We need that marker that is ahead of us to be able to have understudied or to have studied and understood exactly what to do when we get to a place where there seems to be no way. And it takes familiarity with the object for you to be able to pinpoint how you will navigate. And that is the reason why we need to know about the new heavenly Jerusalem. I didn't like that song, but the Holy Spirit challenged me to say something and I owned up. I said, yes, I, 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 I never liked it. I didn't like it. And it was like, it's because you don't know why. And now that I know why, whenever that song comes up, as you can see today, I was in the spirit. That song literally took me out. That's because I have come to know the value of the things that have been said. The things that have been put in front of us. Those markers that are ahead of us. So that when the time comes and others are running into obstacles because the speed that has been granted has been granted to all and sundry, you will not hit the same wall that they are hitting simply because your navigation has already been prepared to avoid the obstacle. There are obstacles in the news today. There is a clamoring going on in the news right now. The Bible says in the last days there will be wars and there will be rumors of war. But you, you need to look up. You are not to take your signaling from the TV signal. Because it is not meant for you. Your vision is a heavenly vision. But right now the news Wants to guide your prayers. A couple of days ago, somebody sent me a message. And it was like, oh, you need to pray for this nation. <laughs> I looked at the message. And I was like, I know why you want me to pray. But it's a carnal reason. It's because of the rumors that you have heard. I said, but I am not going to pray because of the fact that I have seen ahead. And I know certain things are inevitable. Certain things have to happen for the fulfillment of prophecy. I will not speak too plainly, but I believe that I am speaking to people who have a heart of understanding. Who know that when we say that it is written in Revelation, in Jeremiah chapter 9, verse 11. 9 11, you should never forget it. Because 9 11 is a very is a is a date that we are very familiar with that has become synonymous with destruction. Because 9 talks about the fullness of time. 11 is the number of destruction. And so there are certain times wherein destruction has to come because it has been preset and preordained by God. Look at it again. It says, I, who is the I that is speaking here? The government of Iran? No. Russian president? No. The I that is speaking here is the author of life himself, 
the author and the finisher of our faith. He says, I will make Jerusalem a heap of ruins, the den of jackals. I will make the cities of Judah desolate without inhabitants. Look at verse 12. He says, who is the wise man who may understand this? And who is he to whom the mouth of the Lord has, has spoken, that he may declare it? Why does the land perish and burn up like a wilderness so that no one can pass through? Let me tell you something. It takes a heart of understanding to know what the Spirit of the Lord is saying unto the churches. I come to challenge you today in the name of God to not allow yourself to operate by the conductors of the religious orchestra and let your heart respond only to the leading of the Holy Spirit because Jesus will say they will come in my name and even call themselves Jews. He says, but they are not Jews, but they are of the synagogue of Satan. When did he say that? He said that to John in Revelations. Jesus was making clear the message that was coming from the angel of the churches. And one of the things that Jesus found the need to stress in particular to John was the fact that he needs to watch out for the warmongers who would call themselves Jews but who are nothing but members of the synagogue of Satan. Hear me and hear me good because when the Lord says, who is that man that will declare it? Let me show you Rabokus Tigidum Dala de Fribin de Darikeda Bosti Alabra Bobokus of the Rikeda. Hallelujah. I thought we, we, we looked into this the other day. Um, one of the prophecies of Jeremiah, I believe it was Jeremiah chapter 11, verse 21. Anybody remember that? Jeremiah 11, 21, somebody's giggling already, so I'm guessing you remember it. And look at what it says. What does it say? It says, therefore, thus says the Lord concerning the men of Anathor, who seek your life, saying, do not prophesy in the name of the Lord, lest you die by our hand. You know, before these bombings began, the Lord already said to us that we need to watch out for the men of Anathoth. You know the meaning of Anathoth? Anathoth means the men who themselves are an answer to prayers. <laughs> Is he getting clearer? The ones that the world considers to be an answer to prayers. They who are supposed to be an answer to prayers. Ah, I'm going to spell it out just because I have come to that particular point in time wherein I have come to know that I should prophesy. You know, there are times when you know you can prophesy. That is still talking about ability. But when you know that you should prophesy, you're talking about responsibility. I have celebrated the divine abilities that have been given by the grace of God in Christ Jesus. But the time comes wherein your ability is your privilege and your privilege needs to announce your responsibility. So my responsibility it is to prophesy because God said, who shall we send? Who will go? Who is that man of understanding? Who will declare it? I declare to you today that there was one man who was an answer to prayers. Abraham and Sarah, they prayed. And God gave them an answer to prayers. And when you look at the name of that man today, we all know what it is called through one of his seed who became the name of that lineage. When the man who themselves are supposed to be an answer to prayer begin to tell you not to prophesy because they don't like what you are saying, that is when you lift up your voice and say that I will not die in the hands of the man of Anathot, but I will live to declare the works of God. I found myself in the middle of the night a couple of days ago wrestling with the opposition. They came to me and they threatened me with death. And the Lord said to me, it is now time for you to speak. So I rose up in that vision and I said, I will not die but live to declare the works of God. You see, many people that are on pulpits this weekend will be making announcements for prayers to be said that are against the will of God. 
The majority this weekend will be praying. And when you see the majority, Jesus said, be warned, narrow is the way. And difficult, the one that leads to life. He said, but the one that leads to destruction, that's where everybody is. He said, it is broad and it is easy. If I was raising prayers to stop a war that has happened or that is happening because God commanded it, if I am praying for that war to be shut down or to move in a particular way or the other, I would have a lot of people responding to me because that is the natural affinity of people is to be with the popular, is to be with the consensus, is to be in the broad path that is easy. It is difficult for you to rise up and pray against the men who themselves are an answer to prayers. We're not praying against them. We're only declaring what the Lord has said. You know, I was going to tell you about the men of Anathoth and the Lord said to me, no time. But the time has come today. We know who the men of Anathoth are. We know the ones who are themselves an answer to prayer. Their name means an answer to prayer. And now we are telling them what the word of the Lord is saying concerning their land or concerning their cities. <laughs> Whose report will you believe? We shall believe the report of the Lord. You see, when I told you that it was an emergency, what, do, what number do you call when there is an emergency? 911. So I was in the middle of Matthew. I was going to read you some, some sweet memory verses just to encourage you to stay the course, to encourage you on how to be a prophet. And the Lord said to me, there is an emergency. Instead of trying to explain to you, I model to you what it means to be a prophet. I stand here today declaring to you that which is not popular. I stand here telling you that the Lord is looking for men that will declare his mind, even though it's against the men of Anathoth. It's not going to be popular. People would tell us off for it. If there's anybody else still listening, actually. You know, because this is not the first time that we are saying things that people don't want to hear. And we have been unfollowed. We have been muted. I mean, our posts are, you know, but we cannot be muted simply because we are the Lord's battle axe. You see, the beauty of it is this. Jesus says many will come and say that we have worked miracles in your name. He said, but I will still say that I do not know you. Depart from me, you workers of iniquity. He says, I only know you if you have done the will of my Father. And the will of the Father is to take the narrow path. I'm just going to read verse 13. I'm going to read verse 13, not just. I will read verse 13. And it says, And the Lord said, Because they have forsaken my law, which I set before them, and have not obeyed my voice, nor walked according to it. The Lord is saying, I will do this thing simply because of the fact that they did not heed my voice. Now, let me ask you, of all the times that we have heard God himself speak from heaven, which one is more, most prominent? Which one do you most readily remember? Of the times that the heavens have opened, you know God sends prophets. God will send prophets. I said, God, tell them this. He will send, he will raise people, maidens, to prophesy. He will send kings to make declarations. But there was one particular time, especially, when in the Bible says the heavens opened and God spoke. You know, there are times wherein God will send a prophet and you will ignore. Jesus told a parable. He said there was a man who had a, who had a, a farm. And he sent a warning to his people, to his employees who are working the farm, or the people that the farm was contracted out to, rather, he said, but they did not heed the prophets. They did not heed the judges. They did not heed even his own son. They took him and they killed him. You see, God is saying, there are times wherein I will send people to you and you will not listen. He said, I get it. He said, but why, the reason why I am doing what I am doing in Jerusalem, the reason why I am destroying those cities is because of the fact that I sent you my voice and you did not heed my voice. And what did the voice of the Lord say? In the day that the heavens opened at the baptism of Jesus Christ, 
where Jesus was baptized, what happened? The Bible says the heavens opened and the Holy Spirit descended upon him as a dove. And a voice came from heaven, the voice of God. And he says, this is my beloved son in whom I am well pleased. Hear him. If a nation decides to not recognize the sonship of Christ. The Bible says to deny Christ is the spirit of the Antichrist. May you not misappropriate your sympathies. May you not become sentimental when you are supposed to be instrumental. You see, in the times that we're in, you're supposed to be instrumental as prophets, as voices that declare. And someone says, but I don't think God's called me to be a prophet. These are the last days, my friends. Everybody is prophesying. The Bible says, in the last days, I will pour out my spirit upon all flesh. Your old men will dream dreams. Your young men will see visions. And your maidens will prophesy. And the reason why it is important for you to know that the maidens are prophesying is because the maidens, at the culture that that prophecy came to was a culture that put maidens last. And so if the people that were put last by men have not been elevated by God to prophesy, then what, is the rest, what, what are we doing, the rest of us? Every single one of us are meant to, every one of us is meant to speak as an oracle of God. And God reminded us specifically, those of us who are here, that he has called us to speak regardless of the men of other thought. Don't let them keep you silent. We are to prophesy. And that is the reason why we are here and we will speak the mind of God and we will prophesy. Why? Because the Bible says that the testimony of the Lord Jesus is the spirit of prophecy. And so anyone who denies the sonship of Jesus Christ, let truth be told, they have to be told off because they are of the synagogue of Satan. And I will not bow the knee before the Almighty God to pray against his will. When I was growing up, our pastor used to say, let us call a spade a spade and not just a farm tool. Because of people that are trying not to offend the shovel. They're trying not to offend the cutlass or the machete. And so, instead of them to say, the word of the Lord has come to the spade, arise and dig. They're like, but if I say spade, the shovel may feel bad. They may feel mar marginalized. So what I'm going to do is I'm just going to say, can the farm tool dig? No. Jesus says, let your yea be yea and your nay be nay. He says, you don't have to swear by the heavens. He says, don't even swear by your own head because you cannot make one strand of hair. He says, so do not attempt to be convoluted. He says, just say what it is as it is. And that is the reason why I am telling you do not allow yourself to be caught. I'm saying this because tomorrow is Sunday. Some people here or watching will go to some places and they will be told that it is time. Let me tell you something. People will tell you that you need to pray for the peace of Jerusalem. Because the Bible says pray for the peace of Jerusalem for in it you have peace. Yes, I am praying for the peace of Jerusalem. And this is how I am praying for the peace of Jerusalem. That the will of God be done and not the will of man. Because there will be no peace until the wrath of God is expended. It is just the way it is. It is the word of the Lord. So I want to encourage you today. Take a cue from me. And speak the mind of God. Always. Regardless of how unpopular it is. Regardless of how it's going to be received. Let me say this because many of us, we have only been taught to speak concerning our needs. Confess it, profess it, claim it, receive it. When Jesus was teaching about authority, one of the examples that he used, or one of the things that he warned against was this. He says, don't take all that power and be seeking against material and worldly things. He says, after these things do the Gentiles seek. He says, but you seek ye first the kingdom of God and its righteousness. Speak the mind of God. Declare. Because the voice of the Lord is being rejected. And people want to recruit you into that camp. 
What will you say you are doing there? What? So I'm going to address people who are watching online because I know that those of us here, we already know the assignment. We understand the assignment. I say to you today that there is no other name above the name of Jesus. Do not elevate another name above the name of Jesus. Anyone that you know of that does not bear the fruits that are worthy of the Son of God, who is called Yeshua HaMashiach, desist from them so you do not share in their trouble. For the Bible says that the companionship of fools shall be destroyed. I have come to warn against the evil that is to come. And you know I've been saying it, that many people will be caught in the trap that is between the wind coming on the land and the one that is going to come on the sea, right? And you saw the series of winds that came on the land, the earthquakes and the floodings and all of those happened, and we're about to transition to the one that will come to the sea and the space in between, people are now being caught in the rumors of war. They are being caught in a battle that is happening because the Lord has spoken. The four concomitances of evil are being humbled by the Lord according to the prophecy of, of Peter. And what are those that Peter said that the Lord is going to deal with? He says the Lord is going to deal with Pontius Pilate. He will deal with Herod. He will deal with the children of Israel. And he will deal with the Gentiles. He says, the leaders of the Gentiles, he says, these four, the Lord will deal with them and there will be an unfolding, the judgment of the Lord as it has been ordained. It's there in Acts chapter 4. And why is the judgment of the Lord coming upon them? When you read from Acts chapter 4 verse 26, it says that because, in fact, let's read it together so that you will know the reason why these things are happening. Jeremiah 9, 11 is happening because in verse 13, we are told that they did not pay attention to the voice of the Lord. And what did the voice of the Lord say? The voice of the Lord says that this is my beloved son in whom I'm well pleased. I'm not sending you anybody else. This is it. So if you're waiting for another Messiah, forget it. This is it. I have already sent my beloved son. He said, but I'm bringing destruction because you did not pay attention to it. Now come, 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 come. Let us go to Acts chapter 4. Because sometimes people are like, oh, this is harsh. Okay, well, tell Peter. Kind of like following his footsteps right here. Look at what he says in Acts chapter 4, verse 26. He was quoting, um, he was quoting, I will tell you who he was quoting now when I see it. Now, look at Acts chapter 4, verse 26. Initially, he was quoting David from Psalms 118, verse 22. Let's first of all read verse 23. The Bible says, and being let go, they went to their own companions and reported all that the chief priests and elders had said to them. Verse 24. So when they had heard that they raised their voices and went, so sorry. So when they had heard that, they raised their voices to God with one accord and said, Lord, you are God who made heaven, earth, and sea and all that is in them. Who by the mouth of your servant David have said, why did the nations rage? And the people plot vain things. The kings of the earth took a stand. And the rulers were gathered together against the Lord and against his Christ. When you gather against Christ, you have gathered against the Lord. Because he says, I and my father are one. You cannot choose to worship the God of Abraham without worshiping the seed of Abraham. Who came in the name of the Lord. For truly against your holy servants, Jesus, whom you anointed, both Herod, Pontius Pilate, and the Gentiles, with the Gentiles rather, and the people of Israel were gathered together. Pontius Pilate represents elected government officials, whether it is in your country or at the United Nations or NATO, whichever one of those officials, they are championed Mostly not by civil servants, but by elected officials. So that's what Pontius Pilate represents. Herod represents the kings of the earth. The corporations, 
the landowners. Because we often forget that Canada, as big as it is, 96 point something percent of Canada belongs to one family who lives in England. I'm not just telling you conspiracy theories. These are facts. You can go and look it up yourself. Those are the people that the Bible is talking about, the kings of the earth, the ones to whom people pay taxes. <clears throat> this is 2023, and 96 point something percent of that entire landmass still in the title deed is in one family name. And it is in their old name before they changed it from whatever German thing it was. But in any case, that is a story for another day. The Bible says that those people, including the Gentiles. So there are Gentiles who have come to associate themselves with them and we know who they are. They are the five Roman families and the five families that were called the barbarians. They were the Germanics. And when I say Germanic, I'm talking about the, the entire sect of people who resisted the, 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 uh, the, the Roman invasion and decided to form a pact. And so these are the ten families that are being referred to here. They're not just kings, but they are the pact of the Gentiles as prophesied by Daniel. Remember the vision of Daniel when Nebuchadnezzar saw a, a beast, I mean, an image, a statue, and a stone cut without hands came and destroyed the statue. What was the very last thing about that statue that was talked about? The Bible says that when the statue was crossed, the toes of the statue, all ten toes, were scattered abroad the face of the earth and they became the chief of the people. And one interesting fact about the toes was that the toes were made of iron and clay. The barbarians were called the clay civilization and the Romans were called the iron civilization. That is history, right? You can go and this is on Wikipedia. Because the barbarians did most of their buildings using clay. The Romans used iron to forge most of what they used. And so it is the mixture of those that became the ten families that are being referred to here. So you have the elected government officials, and then you have kings that are kings also by partial appointment and also partial imposition. And then you have the Gentiles, and then it didn't stop there. It says, look at it, it says, what else do you have? You have, and that is the reason why the word there, it says, Herod and Pontius Pilate with the Gentiles. Because Pontius Pilate also represents Rome with the Gentiles. The iron and the clay. Does it make sense? And then it says, and the children of Israel, they will gather together for one assignment. And what is that assignment? They will deny Christ. They will not heed the voice of God. How many times have we heard the voice of God? When Jesus raised Lazarus from the dead, the heavens opened also. But it was just like lightning. The people who stood around did not hear the voice of God at that particular point in time. To them, it was noise. But to Jesus, it was the clear voice of his father. So we didn't know what he said at that particular point in time. So you could say that it was the voice of God because Jesus said so. But did anybody else hear it? No. But when he came at, at the baptism, at the baptism of Jesus, he says, this is my beloved son. When next did we hear the voice of God audibly? That was clear. On the Mount of Transfiguration. Peter, James, and John, they were witnesses representing the ecclesia. And that time, the Lord did not just say, hear him. He says, obey him. I'm elevating that authority now from what it was. I want you to recognize him, and now I want you to obey him. Now, and God is not saying anybody who invalidates or attempts to disdain that voice has already chosen their position that they are against the Lord. And if they're against the Lord, they're against the church or the ecclesia because we are the ones anointed by him. And that's why it says the servant of the, Lord, of the Lord and his anointed ones. The reason why I'm saying this is very critical. And I'm going to read one verse of scripture, one more verse of scripture here. And we're going to go. Verse 20, it says, for truly against, verse 27 again, for truly against your holy servant Jesus, whom you anointed. And the word servant there means the one that you sent. A servant is somebody that you sent, a messenger. So it's not because that Jesus is God's servant, okay? Jesus is the only begotten son of God, and he is called the everlasting father because he and the father, they are one. He is the express, man, express manifestation of the father. So the word servant there is because of the fact that when people were translating this, they 
translated it kind of like literally, but what it means is the one that you sent, Jesus. And look at what it says. He says, all of those people, they have gathered together to do whatever your hand and your purpose determined before to be done. I would, I would indulge and read more because it's easier to read it here than to take you back to Jeremiah. What I was going to show you in Jeremiah, which I have shown you before, is also right here in the book of Acts chapter 4 verse 29. What, did, what does it say? It says, now, Lord, look on their threats. Many of us will be threatened to be excommunicated if, if we can be, because at this particular point in time, we're already not in their company. But they will, thank you, Cody, they may threaten us with, with all kinds of things, with isolating us, with, you know, saying that we're no longer Christians because we're not supporting what the majority is supporting. But the reality of it is this. Jesus says, I will build my church not on the consensus of opinion, but on personal revelation. Do you remember that? When Jesus said to his disciples, who do men say that I, the son of man, am? He, then they started responding. They said, some say that you're a prophet. Some say that you're a teacher. He says, okay, I've heard that. That's what people are saying. But who do you say that I am? And Peter was like, you are Christ, son of the living God. And Jesus was like, okay. Flesh and blood have not revealed that to you, but my father which is in heaven. He says, you are Peter. He says, now, it is between you and the word that you have received. So what did he say after that? He says, upon this rock, this structure of man, receiving revelation directly from God, I will build my ecclesia and the gates of hell will not be able to prevail against it. Jesus says, I will build on this structure of personal revelation, wherein you hear what God is saying as opposed to what flesh and blood is revealing. So if you have not prayed until you hear something in the news, then who is leading your prayer? Men. If you have not prayed concerning a particular nation or a particular region of the world until a group of religious people say, oh, now we are going to pray, then they are the ones directing you, not the Holy Spirit. And that is the reason why it is important for each and every one of us to hear God for ourselves so that we stop idolizing other men. God alone be praised. Paul says, Paul says, you don't respect me because I don't lord over you. He says, you people don't take me seriously. He said, because I'm not like the Gentiles. He says, the, the rulers of the Gentiles lord over them. He says, but we have made one commitment and one commitment only to be helpers of your joy. How do you help someone's joy? By helping them to hear the word of God because when you hear the word of God, you will hear joy and gladness. As opposed to borrowed oil. Many believers or many Christians today are living on sensations that are drummed from other people. Wherein we're supposed to help each other to get to the water and drink. I can go and bring you water. But I have one commitment to you. God forbid that I make you depend on me. My commitment to you is wherever I got that water from, you need to know the place. You need to come and drink water yourself. I will show you where I got this from. Because that is what Jesus will build on. Jesus cannot allow middlemen because this assignment is too precious. That was why he asked them. He says, I need to know how these boys are thinking. Who do men say that I am? You know what they were supposed to say? They were supposed to say, how would we know? We don't listen to men. We listen to only you. But they didn't say that. But guess what happened after that experience? When they saw the way Jesus commended Peter, and you are Peter. You know, I like to call you Peter because I heard the Lord call you Peter one day. You see, after that experience, the next time Jesus asked them a similar question, they said, they says, they said no, we're not going anywhere. You have the word of life. Now we, have, we are wise now. We listen to only you. That is where God wants us to get to. Jesus wants us to get to the place when we listen to him. That we hear his voice. 
That was why Jesus says, when I return, will I find faith on the earth? The reason why is because faith comes by hearing, and hearing comes by the word of God. So when you don't hear the word of God personally for yourself, what you don't have, what you have is not faith. Many people have op optimism simply because they listen to a motivational speaker who can run through many scriptures very quickly to make them feel like, yes, I can possess the land. But did you hear God say that to you? Every one of us, we need to be able to hear God. And that is what Jesus says, I will build my ecclesia and the gates of hell will not prevail against it on personal revelation. Now look at what the Bible says here that we have just read. He says, this was, Paul, this was Peter speaking. He says, now look, O Lord, upon their threats and grant to your servants that with all boldness they may what? Speak your word. What is one other expression? The synonym of speaking the word of God is what? Prophesy. He says, grant that with all boldness that we may prophesy. What is our mission in all of what is going on? In the midst of all the commotion, Sister Roberta, we have one mission. And that mission in the midst of all of the chaos is to prophesy. Is to speak the word of God. And the men of Anathoth have tried to shut us down. They tried to shut down Peter and the Ecclesia in Acts chapter 4. When they forbade them from speaking in the name of God. And you know what happened? Peter started to pray. In my Bible, that entire passage is titled A Prayer for Boldness. And he was praying that all we need, we don't need you to take us out of here. We don't need you to shut down their televisions. We don't need you to do anything other than to grant to us that with boldness that we will prophesy. Because they know that all that changes everything is the word of God. One word and there is light. And so I'm encouraging you today that the Lord is committed to granting this prayer. Because he did it once before, he will do it again. The, see, we have not because we do not, have, we do not ask. And when we ask, sometimes we ask amiss. Many people are asking for revivals that will do nothing but line other people's money, make pockets with money. People are asking for the kind of revival that will just make certain churches grow to the point where they have to keep building bigger auditoriums. Because they're asking, I mean, the power is going to come. It's not going to come. The, what we need to ask for to experience the will of God on earth is this. Ask that he will give us the boldness to prophesy. Because when they ask this prayer, look at what happened. The Bible says... In verse 30, he says, By stretching out your hand to heal, that signs and wonders may be done through the name of your holy servant Jesus. These are the things that happen when we are truly speaking the word of God. He says, And then, when they had prayed, the place where they were, where they were assembled together, was shaken, and they were filled with the Holy Spirit, and they spoke the word of God with boldness. They asked and they received. I want to encourage you, ladies and gentlemen, that for a moment and for a period, suspend whatever material thing that you think you lack. Put aside whatever pain and suffering that you have identified to be troubling you. Lay everything aside. These were men who had laid the world aside. They had put the world behind them and the cross alone before them. All they could ask of God was to let them speak his word with boldness. And when God gave them that ability, when the Lord answered that prayer, the Bible says that the fear of them fell upon all that were without. Everybody outside of their camp became afraid of them. And why is that important? It just means that God was with them. Because when the Lord is with you, the presence of the Lord is all. And we want the presence of God. We want to see those miracles, but we're not asking for miracles. He didn't ask for miracles. He asked that they may speak the word. And he knew that the moment they spoke the word, God would stretch out his hand. And when God stretches out his hand, miracles happen. We can't do it backwards. We've done that long enough. At this time, Ask for the boldness to prophesy. Now, the Lord will have me say this to you. The reason why he took me this route and took, took this approach with me for your sake is because heaven is ready to put words in people's mouths. 
But God wants you to know what to do with it when you get it. He doesn't want you to swallow that word or to keep it in your mouth and be using hand signs to talk to people. He doesn't want you to receive his word and then be sheepish about it. He doesn't want you to receive that word and then compromise your position by saying, you know, uh, this is what God is saying, but if I said that, that person may not talk to me again. But if it's better for people, some people not to talk to you again than for God not to talk to you again. Because men shall not live by bread alone, but by every word that proceeds out of the mouth of Kenyatta, no, out of the mouth of God. You, you want to hear God, not people. What is worth hearing from people is that which allows you to hear from God. If they're not helping you to hear from God, skip that video. Skip that place. I dare to say to you, skip that church. If they are not helping you to hear for yourself. Because when you're here for yourself and you have prayed for the boldness to speak, God will give it to you. So lastly, I'm going to say this. And the reason why this has become very critical is because we are heaven's last hope. Someone says, are we that important? Yes, we are. And it's in the Bible. The Bible says that we have been called to show forth the praises of him who has brought us out of the darkness into his marvelous light. The Bible says, how would they know unless you tell them? We are the ones that have been called to be witnesses of him, to be witnesses to the light. We are the ones who have been called to be the voices of them in the wilderness, declaring the word of the Lord. God has laid every foundation and paved every way for you and I to be able to stand at this time to speak the mind of God. Are we going to respond or are we going to abandon? We will not abandon our positions because heaven is counting on us. And the reason why heaven is counting on us is because God knows that we are able. And how does he know that we are able? Because he's the one that is working through us, both to will and to do of his good pleasure. So what I've been telling you for weeks right now is that what God will do, he will do. It is left for you to choose whether he does it through you or he finds another person. You know, when John the Baptist found that he was the only one in the wilderness crying, you know what he said to the Pharisees? He said to them when they finally showed up, he was like, so you are finally escaping wrath. Well done. He said, who warned you? Because you didn't come here to listen to me. Who warned you to flee the wrath that is to come? He said, but I've got news for you. God is not impressed by you being here. He told them, John the Baptist was a person like me who did not care much of peop for people's accolades. He said, you know some people that you've been inviting to church for so long when they finally come, you're like, <laughs> Pastor, please don't preach too long today. We've been inviting these people for six months. They're finally here. Make your message short and sweet. Forget about all that end time stuff. Don't read Jeremiah. Don't shout and scream. Don't tell them that some other people are praying against the will of God. Just preach something nice because we don't want to scare them away. And as soon as I hear that, I'm like, thank you, Jesus, because I will scare them away. You know why? The Bible says, and Jesus drove away the multitude because he knew what was in their heart. The Bible says Jesus did not commit himself to them because he knew what was in their hearts. And so when John the Baptist came, when the Pharisees came to John the Baptist, they came with their long robes and there were many of them. They came and they brought the scribes with them to impress the man of God. And you know what John the Baptist was saying to them was this. He said to them, he says, even you, you're afraid now you want to escape the wrath that is to come. He said, but I tell you, God is not impressed. He said, because God already told me that if you fail to show up, he will raise up stones. <laughs> and the devil knew that he had the Pharisees in his pocket. So that was Matthew chapter 3. So Matthew chapter 4, the moment Jesus showed up in the power of the Holy Spirit, after out, coming out from a 40-day fast, what was the first thing Satan told him? Satan told him to turn the stones into bread because he was like the stones are the last card.
The Pharisees were the religious people who were supposed to be the men of honor thought. They themselves were supposed to be men of the legion, not legion, of the order of answered prayers. But they already failed God. And John the Baptist told them that, well, you have shown up, we're not impressed. Even if you didn't come or you are here and your heart is not fully right, we, we don't, we're not worried too much about you because God is ready to raise an army from these stones. Satan heard that. Then he wanted Jesus to turn the stone to bread. Because the moment the stones become bread and the Pharisees are ready in his pocket, then heaven does not have a final army. <clears throat> but Jesus did not turn the stone to bread. What are we singing in the world today? The same people who are supposed to be the children of God. Saints who are supposed to be believers have been turned into bread everywhere you go. They've been turned into bread, to money, buy books, pay for conference, buy t-shirt. People are being turned into bread. The same stones that Jesus says I will use to build because they are the last frontier. Satan thinks he's got us. What did I tell you, Alan, yesterday when you sent me that message? I said they have surrounded us but they don't know that there is a bigger circle that is surrounding them. You see, because every outer circle is larger in circumference than every inner one. And so when Gehazi, the servant of Elisha, saw that the army of Syria had surrounded them, he says, my father, my father, we, we, let us resign. Let us deny God so that we can live to eat bread tomorrow. He said, because the men of Syria have surrounded us. And Elisha was like, are you serious? Can you not see that there is a bigger circle behind them? Gehazi looked and was like, all I can see is the horizon. What are you saying? And the man of God touched his eyes. And then he saw. And that was when he recognized that there are more who are with us than the ones who are against us. And the reason why I prophesy with boldness is because the ones who have threatened to take me out are already being taken out and they don't even know. Because every time they try to lay their hands on me, Somebody taps their shoulder and whacks them a big blow because there is a bigger ring and that ring is for me. The reason why you must speak with boldness is because you are that rock, you are those stones that God is banking on because the religious order has failed. And, the set, and Satan wants to turn you into bread. Stay stone, my friends. Stay hard. They want you to be soft. Stay hard because God is not going to build with bread. He will build with stones. As we break bread today in the mighty name of Jesus, I want to encourage you with another verse of scripture from Matthew 27, verse 19. I want to encourage you from this scripture as we break bread so that you choose the report that you will believe. Matthew 27, verse 19. The Bible says that while he was sitting on the judgment seat, his wife sent to him saying, have nothing to do with that just man. For I have suffered many things today in a dream because of him. I want you to recognize that their blood is not on your hands because they were warned by God. This was Pilate. Pilate was warned. They were all warned, but they still chose to be against Jesus. So I put it to you today. Why should you sympathize with the ones who made their choices to be against the Lord? They're not in error by accident. They are in error by rebellion. Don't let anybody tell you otherwise. This is the word of God. So what do we do? As we receive the body and the blood of Jesus today, we say that we renounce petition. We will not be Judas. We will not be Pilate. But we will be the ones who rejoice at the name of the Son of God, Yeshua HaMashiach. That we will not be of them that turn back unto petition. But we will be of the company of those who press on to the saving of the soul. 
that as the Lord has chosen to reserve us for this time, stones with which he will build, we will not become bread in his hand. So Father, in the mighty name of Jesus, we thank you because as we eat of the Lord's body today and drink of his blood, we drink unto renewal of purpose. We drink unto clarity of assignment. We eat and we drink unto boldness that we may speak your word without fear. That we may speak your word without any intimidation. That we may speak your word boldly. That we may make it about your kingdom coming as opposed to our own kingdom coming. Father, in the mighty name of Jesus, as we drink and eat today, may we lighten the load of ego and of ambition. And let it be about the cross and nothing more. And nothing less. You may eat of the Lord's body and drink of his blood in remembrance of him. In Matthew 28, 19. It says, go, therefore, because he has given you all authority. In verse 18, Jesus came and spoke to them, saying, all authority has been given me in heaven and on earth. Go, therefore. I pray for you today that in the mighty name of Jesus that you will go. And do the will of your heavenly father. That you may become a fruit bearing tree. Bearing the fruits of righteousness. That he might be glorified. In the mighty name of Jesus. I want you to put your hand on your head if you can. Anyone works just lay your hand on your head. And say Holy Spirit. Breathe on me. That I may receive understanding. That I may receive understanding to speak your word. See, I want us to listen for one second. You see this prayer? I beg of you, I want you to pray with all your heart. When the word of the Lord came to Jeremiah, God was like, I have two requirements. He says, I need them to be men of understanding. If they're going to declare, who will declare? It has to be the one with a heart of understanding. And so as you pray today, say, Holy Spirit, breathe on me. Breathe on me. The Bible says there is a spirit in man and the inspiration, the breath of the Almighty gives him understanding. Holy Spirit, breathe on me that I may speak the word of my heavenly father with boldness. In the mighty name of Jesus. I want to encourage you. Be on the lookout. The Lord is about to use you mightily. He will tell you exactly what you must do, where you must go, and what you must say. And when you get there, let no face or attitude intimidate you. God is looking for this last line of offense to go forth and put the gates of hell in its place. Who shall we send who will go for us? God is not looking for your ability this time around. He's looking for your availability. Will you say, here I am, Lord, send me. Wherever you send me, I will go and I will speak your word with boldness. Help me, Holy Spirit. In the mighty name of Jesus. I want us to all say, thy kingdom come. Your will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Amen. Praise the Lord. Communion House, God bless you. I hope to see you on Tuesday. Until then.
keep speaking his word. Hallelujah. God is good. God is good. God is good. As we prepare our offering, one thing I was reminded of earlier is what the man of God declared over us maybe a year ago now. And the prophecy was, they will wonder how you did it, how you got here because the context was knowing or to stop thinking that we're late to the game, you see. And I'm encouraged by that word and what the Lord has brought forth to us tonight. And even as the man encouraged us, man of God encouraged us, as he wrapped up, is that the Lord is just looking for us to show up. Are we available? It don't matter your title, your degree, how much schooling you got. Are you going to show up for the Lord? And it's such an opportunity. The given details are on the screen here. Dollar sign, Communion House, Cash App, at Communion House, PayPal, as well as the Zelle, giving information. If you haven't checked out our website as of late, communion.house slash give is another way that you can so into this fertile ground. What a word tonight, a word of comfort, of encouragement, of charge. I'll give us a few more seconds to prepare our offering. If you need an envelope, our brother Kenyatta has it there to his side. Hallelujah. Father, we give you praise for this time of meeting of instruction and my prayer for us tonight is many a times as the word has come forth the Lord has privileged me through his mercy through his love to experience the word displayed in images via dreams there have been many of words that have come forth and that night I will go into a dream concerning the instruction concerning what has come forth, and that is my prayer for us tonight, that grace, for freely have I received, freely I give unto you all. Press into this with the word that has come forth. Father, we give you praise for what you have made available to us tonight, a time of impartation, of stirring, the charge of heaven, O oh God, quickening within us by the Holy Ghost, making our feet light to your instruction. You've come before us, or we have encountered you tonight through your mercy, through your love, your unfailing love for us. And Lord, we give you praise for the word that you have spoken through your prophet. For indeed, as we believe on it, in it, our way shall be made prosperous. We shall have safe journey. Indeed, we shall step in precision, O oh God by the leading of your Holy Spirit. Lord, we thank you for these offerings, for the seed that you have granted us, for your word declares that you give seed unto the sower. And Lord, we give cheerfully tonight. We give in honor, in obedience. Oh God, we give in thanks for what you have done and what you continue to do through this house, that is communion house that you have established, O oh God. Lord, let these offerings be found pleasing in your sight. We give you praise for indeed you have granted unto us increase, multiplication, O oh God, that we may do your bidding. We declare that all glory and honor belong to you. And we all said, amen. Let us celebrate the Lord and what he has done tonight. God is good. So much stirring tonight. We got plenty to run with. The vision has been made plain. Be expecting as we lay our head down to sleep of what will come forth, what the Lord will reveal to us, because this is an exciting time. You know, it's the last day 
the Lord is with us until the end of the age. And uh, I'm thankful yet again to be with brothers and sisters like you all doing the work of the Lord. Amen. Everyone have a blessed night.